Good morning and welcome to Greenhill Baptist Church at the end of a holiday week here in Mobile. We're excited that you're here this morning, and if you are visiting with us, you are our honored guest, and we would love to have a record of your visit. You can do that by filling the connection card out that's in the pew pocket in front of you and dropping it in the offering plate later in the service this morning. This just lets us know that you were here and which ministries here at Spring Hill Baptist Church you would be interested in knowing more about. We have so many activities coming up over the next few weeks, so many ways for you to be involved and to engage here at Spring Hill Baptist. Today, we want to keep our um, honor choir in our prayers. We have eight children who have been with Debbie Rice all weekend representing Spring Hill Baptist Church at the Alabama Baptist Honor Choir. They will be returning from Tuscaloosa today, so prayers for their safe travels. This afternoon, we have a family mission project, and it is not too late to sign up. We will be making cards for the Valentine Project, and if you would like to join us, just let me know. We would love to have you with us this afternoon. Tomorrow morning, we will begin a month-long prayer emphasis for our church. This afternoon, you will receive an email that will give you some points that we will be specifically praying for, and we're asking that at 8 o'clock a.m., that you, no matter where you are and what you're doing, you stop for just a few minutes over the next month and pray for our church. We will also be praying corporately on Friday mornings. This Friday, you have two opportunities to do that. You can join us at 6.30 a.m. or at noon here in the sanctuary. Next Friday night, March the 11th, we have an exciting opportunity for our students. We are having a camp out at Blakely Park. The cost is $5. You can sign up online, and it's for all 7th through 12th graders. We have our preteen egg EGG extravaganza coming up on March 18th at the Activity Center. If your fourth through sixth grader would like to join us for a night of food, fun, and fellowship, you can sign up with Amy Browning. We are also getting ready for our GAT. That will be Sunday, March the 27th. This is for first through sixth grade girls, and they can invite their mothers, their grandmothers, or a special lady friend to enjoy them for this fun afternoon. And then our music ministry is busy preparing for a beautiful, beautiful week of worship during Holy Week. And you can see that schedule online on our online messenger. This week, I saw a quote by Francis Chan that said, Isn't it a comfort to worship a God who cannot be exaggerated? And isn't that true? There's no way that we can exaggerate the power, the strength, the wisdom, the creativity, the grace, the mercy, the love, and the goodness of our God. So this morning, as we enter into a time of worship with the God who cannot be exaggerated, will you please join me in a time of prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning and we thank you that you are a God that is beyond our comprehension, beyond our imagination, beyond our exaggeration. We know that there are truly no words of praise, worship, thanks, that are adequate enough to express all that you have done, all that you are doing, and all that you will do. But dear God, as we enter into this time of worship, we offer you hearts that are humble and that are full of praise and gratitude for you. We pray for our brothers and sisters here in our church family and friends of our church family who can't be here today because they are walking very difficult paths, whether it's due to illness are just difficult circumstances, and we ask that you would wrap them up, blanket them in your love, give them a healing touch where it is needed, let them see your presence in unexpected and surprising ways. We ask that as we move into a time of worship, that you would just fill us, you would fill this room, this sanctuary with your presence, that you would fill each and every heart here with your presence, and that when we leave here today, that we would be a better reflection of you, ready to truly be your hands and your feet in this world. In your name we pray, amen.
prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we claim your sovereignty over all nations. We ask that the leaders of the world will seek your favor in their deliberations and decisions. We pray for peace and comfort for all those who are in harm's way. We claim your sovereignty over this church and the decisions we make regarding a new pastor, the missions we pursue for your name, the, those who are ill and need your comfort. And we ask that you use our tithes and offerings to fulfill all of those uh, endeavors in your name. It's your name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, choir, for reminding us all. Philippians 2, 10 and 11 is true. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow on heaven and earth and under the earth, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And what a glorious day that will be. But we're not in that stage yet. You just flip on the news and you can see the kingdom of Christ has come, but it's not fully yet realized, is it? Turn with me in your Bibles to Joel chapter 2. Joel is one of the minor prophets. Not minor because, minor in importance, but minor because in size. Joel chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, and then we're going to read verses 12 and following. Here's what the scripture says. Blow a trumpet in Zion. Sound an alarm on my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble. For the day of the Lord is coming. It is near. A day of darkness and gloom. A day of clouds and thick darkness. Like blackness there is spread upon the mountains. A great powerful people like there has never been before, nor will there be again after them through the years of all generations. And then verse 12, Yet even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart, with fasting and weeping and with mourning, and rend your hearts, not your garments. Return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and merciful slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, and he relents over disaster. Who knows whether he will not turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather the people, consecrate the congregation, assemble the elders, Gather the children, even nursing infants. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber. Between the vestibule and the altar, let the priest, the minister of the Lord, weep and say, Spare your people, O Lord, and make not your heritage a reproach, a byword among the nations. Why should they say among the peoples, Where is their God? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Lord. Give us understanding as we're in this season of Lent. Would you show us and help us to understand and then show us how we can then implement the words from this text. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. It said, first of all, blow a trumpet. The word's actually shafar. We've all seen in the Hebrews the shofar. Maybe some of you have one. You've been in the Holy Land and, and have one and you can blow it. He said, blow the shofar. Now, the shofar was a warning. It was blown to warn that an army was coming. And God's word says, blow the shofar. Judgment day is coming. It's going to be far greater than you can imagine. Blow that horn. Because judgment day is coming on the land. Now, I, with most of you, I pray, Lord, come quickly. Don't you pray that? Even so, Maranatha, come quickly, Lord Jesus. But I believe as a church of Jesus Christ, although we pray for God's kingdom to come, His will be done on earth as in heaven, I think we also need to blow the, the shafar and a warning. Judgment day is coming. Because I want as many boys and girls, men and women in this world, to come to know the Prince of Peace before that judgment comes. And we must be ready, and we must understand that it comes like a thief in the night. You're never really prepared. I was watching BBC News uh, just early this morning, and there was a man who was interviewed, and he was from Ukraine, actually. He is from the southern part of Ukraine. He said, you know, we saw the troops amassed But he said, we really didn't fear because we're pro-Russian. We're in an area that loves Russia. We speak Russia. And so he said, we had nothing to fear. And they said he was going to come in. We knew he wouldn't come in. He might take out a few people, but he promised us he would not do anything. But in that day, he said, we were so shocked. 
because they started shelling our village and our sacred things that we had this common with Russian, they were destroying them. And so he said, we were pro-Russian, but in a moment like that, we have shifted and we no longer pro-Russian. Now, just as Putin promised, I will not invade, God conversely says, I will come again. And unlike Putin, who and many leaders are not necessarily men or women of their word in the world, but God can never lie. And he tells us as a warning, I am coming in a day of judgment. And he will follow through with that judgment. We played Georgiana in football when I was in Monroeville. And this was a team that we were supposed to beat pretty handily. I mean, they were a smaller division. We watched the tape of them and we sort of giggled around because their stadium was not as nice as ours. And, and, and the team was smaller than us. And, and so we just knew this was going to be an, an easy game. And the coach kept warning us, you, you got to take everyone seriously. And, of course, we said we were taking it seriously, but we, we were cutting up. I can remember on the starter bus driving, we were cutting up, driving over to the game and got out there. And we looked at the little field they had and the little field house and the little bitty bleachers they had. I mean, it was puny. If you're from Georgiana, I'm not trying to make fun of you. I'm just saying that's what we were thinking. And we got out there on the field, and all of a sudden, their running back was about this tall, and he weighed about 110 pounds soaking wet, and we were sort of snickering over, look at that little guy. We'll break him in two. The problem is we couldn't catch him. <laughs> not joking. And their quarterback, the coach Kiefer, would call me on the side, and he would say, Rob, Robbie, tackle that quarterback. I said, yes, sir. And I'd get out there, and he'd juke around like this. I'd juke around like that, and he was just running in circles around us. They beat us all over the field. We went back on that bus, and it was deathly silent, except for the coach. <laughs> and the coach flipped on. And of course, I was on the starter bus, so I got to hear the wrath, and I always sat right behind the coach. I don't know why. That was a mistake. But I was there, and he flipped on the light, and his face was raised, a big old guy. And Coach Kiefer said, y'all thought it was funny playing Georgiana. You saw what happened to you, and I'm going to tell y'all something, and you tell the other bus behind us when you get off, y'all be thinking about Monday because Judgment Day is coming. <laughs> now, it really did come. I mean, he lined us up, and of course, over the years, I'm sure the fish gets bigger and bigger and bigger, but... but the quarterbacks and the running backs and the defensive backs were lined up like 15 yards apart, and he had to run over and over again, full speed into each other because we missed so many tackles. And, and then we went to drill after drill, bull in the ring, and I mean, we were all bloodied and beaten to a pulp, and it was hot. I, they didn't give water breaks in those days. My tongue was stuck to the roof of my mouth, and I'm like, dear God, please let this thing in because I don't think I'm going to make it. And then he blew the whistle. On the goal line, that means sprints, by the way. Well, he ran us, and he ran us, and he ran us, and he ran us. And I was thankful I was smaller, and so although I thought I was going to die, those poor linemen, they were falling out, and he'd say, get up, keep running. And after he finished all the sprints, I was just like, we knelt down in the end zone. I mean, people were falling over in the end zone, and like, thank you, Lord, I've made it. He said, what are y'all resting? How many ports did points to Georgiana score and we said 28 said so how many 28 head over to the stadium we went up there and the stadium was tall and guess how many times we had to run up and down 27 times he got us in two groups he'd blow a whistle one would go up there and when they're coming back down he'd blow it again and the other would go so we'd go one two three people were really falling out and I got those one of the toughest days in my life and I'm like Oh, my goodness gracious, thank you, God, that I lived through today. Now, that judgment day of playing football is nothing compared to the judgment day that's coming for God. It's a day that the world that has rejected Him, that He's coming again in glory. And our heart should be broken, knowing there's going to be anyone suffering like that. My heart goes out to Ukraine, doesn't it, you? And these people that are suffering, how much more should on a daily basis we should be concerned because soon He's coming again. And many in this world are not ready. 
blow the shifar and warn. And what are we to do? We'll look back in verse 12. Even now, declares the Lord, return to me with all your heart. What are we to do? Even now, we're to return to him. And this is not a return, people of God, where we're just returning by coming to church. Turning by many more coming and filling up the pews. This is a return to Him with all our heart. What is needed is revival. 1 Peter 4.17 says, Revival begins, judgment begins in the house of God. If it begins with us, then you and I need to understand we must repent. Let's turn from our ways and be sold out to Jesus Christ. To be sold out to love our neighbor as ourselves. To be sold out to giving a cup of cold water in the name of Jesus. To be sold out to to helping those. Judgment day is coming. We are to blow the shafar. And that should be a warning to us. We've got to return and get busy about the things of Christ. And if we're busy about the things of Christ, that means we believe in who He is and what He says He can do. If you look in that scripture... Joel was actually borrowing for Jonah. When Jonah began to to talk and said, you know, God, here's the reason I didn't go to Nineveh, because I knew you were this kind of God and this kind of God. You did all these things. And now, here Joel says, this is who he is. This is the God. And as judgment day is coming, we can return to him so the church of Jesus Christ He's pointing to the church of Jesus Christ. The church of Jesus Christ might be strengthened to help people in their hour of need. What must we do? I believe with all my heart, brothers and sisters, we need to return to God. And we need to understand this war in Ukraine, we can make a difference. How? By praying, believing prayers. Did you realize that God gave wisdom to Solomon? Same God. So we need to pray for all the world leaders to have wisdom from God and boldness to do the right thing. David, do we believe that God used David to slay a giant? Same yesterday, today, forever. We need to pray that David can stand up against Goliath. Why? So that a watching world will see that it's not by might nor by power, but by the Spirit. So a world can see that although some trust in chariots or, or some trust in tanks modernized or, or cruise missiles, we trust in the name of the Lord our God. We as God's people, we need to return to Him in believing faith and know that when we pray that the same God who gave the victory to Gideon by causing confusion all around can cause confusion and cause people to defect and lay down their weapons so there is no no war. The same God who, who Moses saw when the Egyptians came after them with all their military might and the Hebrews were didn't have all that. God caused confusion and the chariots got stuck in the mud. And we can pray that the tanks and the, and the cars run out of gas and they get stuck in the mud. And we can pray that, that people are confusion and the, the bombs cause minimum damage. We can pray all these things. We can pray that the same God who rescued Sennacherib against the great army, I mean Hezekiah against Sennacherib and his great army, that same God will rescue the people and Sennacherib will run back home defeated. We can pray that the same God who spoke and Daniel read the writing on the wall, that those who oppose the living God will see the writing on the wall and they will be feared and they will fear and they will be removed from office. My brothers and sisters in Christ, this is not a time for casual Christianity. This is a day of war. And if we understand the times, that Christ is coming soon, then we need to take a warlike posture. And what is that posture? Not picking up our arms unless we have to, 
but getting on our knees and asking the Lord of the universe to do what only He can do so a watching world can see that He is the only way, the truth, and life. So that President Zelensky can see that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the ruler of all the world. And you and I, because of our relationship to Christ and the power of Jesus Christ, we can change a world. But we must blow the shofar and warning. Judgment day is coming. We must blow the shofar and understand what does it mean to us. We must repent. And repenting, we turn from our ways and we believe in the name of Lord Jesus Christ. But if you look back with me in verse 18, blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast. We must immediately, immediately, in the church of Jesus Christ, return to Him. Listen how urgent it is. Call a solemn assembly. Gather the people. Consecrate the congregation. Assemble the elders. Gather the children, even the nursing infants. Everyone is involved in this, this war. This war to bring the world to know Jesus Christ. Let the bridegroom leave his room and the bride her chamber as they're about to come together in marriage. It's so important. They say, hey, you just leave that aside. Let's come and go before the Lord. And on and on it goes. What must we do? We must return to Him with urgency. And when we return to Him, then we see God do things that only He can do. He was patient with those in Nineveh when Jonah preached, and He had mercy and compassion on them. And He he did not destroy their land. I don't know how long before Christ comes again, but I do know we've been placed here in this moment for such a time as this. For us to be on our knees, yes, but for us also to be a church on our knees. And when God speaks to us, we act on this. We repent and then we act so that the world can be changed. In Claude King's Return to Me, which Claude King wrote Experiencing God with Henry Blackaby. I mentioned him. He's with me a couple weeks ago. I'd love to get you a copy of this. I'd love for you to go through the seven weeks as you and we as a church return to Christ and evaluate our own lives. But he told the story of a church that returned to God. It is the, the living vine missionary Baptist church in Oakland, California. And that church, the, the pastor was just burdened because they just weren't making inroads into the acorn it's a housing project right there by the church. In fact, the church was doing a good time worshiping and gathering together, great choirs, great music, wonderful time, but they weren't turning the world upside down. It was then that he was convicted reading T.W. Hunt's book on the doctrine of prayer that he was convicted. One thing we've got to do, we've got to understand the power of God. And so he took the church through prayer. His wife, Sally began to understand we've we got to not only pray, but we got to go out there and reach this community for Jesus Christ. So she organized a prayer rally where they began to walk around seven times around that big housing project and they would pray. They did it one Saturday. The next Saturday they went and they did the same thing. They walked around it seven times. Now this is a housing project that the Oakland Police Department wouldn't even enter at night because it's so dangerous. It's a place where there were prostitution, drug abuse, gangs, shootings, stabbings, and on and on it goes. But they begin to say, we are going to blow the, the horn. We're going to walk around trusting, just like Joshua and Jericho. We're going to ask that these walls will come tumbling down. Two weeks later, she told, there was a call from the manager of the housing project. said, you know, we, we've got so much crime in here. Most of these kids have no one at home during the day, latchkey kids. Is there anything the church could do? You came to my mind. This missionary Baptist church came to our mind. Is there anything you can do? And they said, oh, yes, we can. We will, as many kids as want to come, we will go and we'll develop an after-school program. We'll feed them. We'll, we'll teach them the Bible. We'll be there. And they averaged every day 150 kids coming through there. Soon these kids begin to know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. They begin to go back to their parents, and their parents begin to be interested. What is this Jesus? My child has changed. 
They're out of the, the gang. They're out of drugs. What's happening? And they begin to, to ask questions, begin to hear about the, the true vine missionary Baptist church. At that time, he didn't know it was a wrong shipment or what. Someone sent to them 12,000 Here's Hope New Testament. And so the pastor said, we just need to go on door and start knocking on them. They began to knock on the door and they said, I want you to know we've got hope for you. And they didn't know how they would respond. Thought the, this hardened area would shut them out, but instead they said, come in. If you've got hope, I need hope. I didn't think there was any hope. And that first day the church went knocking on doors a church that had 500 members. Now, if you have 500 members, you don't have that many in attendance. The first day, 659 people gave their hearts and lives to Jesus Christ. Over the next few months, 1,250 gave their hearts and lives. They, the king drug dealer surrendered in his life to Jesus Christ. Crime began to, to dry up in the area. The church, that little church, was so filled with people. People were gathered there an hour before the service even started just to get seats. And so they'd be standing room only, people sitting around the church trying to hear through the windows. What happened? A pastor and his wife led the church to return to God. And returning to Jesus Christ, they returned to Him in faith. And returning to Him to faith, they began to blow the shofar the warning to the world. And in sharing the good news of Jesus Christ, an area of our country was changed. As I look at Ukraine, as you know, I have friends all in that area. And my heart is broken. But I want you to know that I know the King of kings and Lord of lords. And there is no military that's stronger than he there is no system of government that can twist the arm of God. And God is asking each of us, specifically today, to blow the shofar, to sound the alarm. For what? A warning. Things will one day get very, very bad for the whole world. But sound the alarm in our churches. And that is, until that day comes, let us carry the good news of Jesus Christ. Let us pray for His will to be done. Let us pray for peace from the Prince of Peace. And let us understand this return to Him must start in my life. It must start in each of our lives. To God alone, receive all the glory. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you and we are blowing the trumpet the best we know how. And as we blow the trumpet, warning the world of, of judgment to come, we blow it understanding that you are the Prince of Peace. And that we're coming to you. And what you ask for us is to, to rend our hearts, for us to be broken by the condition of the world. For us to be sold out to you and your glorious good news, the gospel. And for us to do all within our power so that this lost and dying world might come face to face with your son Jesus Christ. Might see his nail scarred hands. Might see his glorious splendor. And might hear his still small voice, come to me all who are weak and heavy laden. And I will give you rest. And with that rest is peace. Lord, bring peace. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The invitation is for each of us today. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, today's the day you need to know the Prince of Peace. What must you do? You turn from your sins and believe in Christ. The Bible says, For God so loved the world, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever, that's all of us, believes in Him, should not perish, but have everlasting life. Would you come? We'll have Paul standing here, and he will talk with you and tell you how you can believe this good news. Or perhaps you're here today, and, and you're looking for a church home. We're a loving congregation. We have a, a wonderful time together, and we'd love for you to be a part of this. 
As always, the altars are open. Maybe you want to pray for Ukraine. Pray for peace in Ukraine. Whatever God's placed on your heart, won't you come as we stand and sing? love and grace. Go and share the invitation with our world.